Good evening. I'm Steve Target, Chair of the Program Committee of the Union League Legacy Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League and is guided by the United States Constitution and the history and values of the Union League of Philadelphia. The Legacy Foundation inspires and educates League members, students, and the greater community, greater community to be engaged in responsible citizens. And we accomplish this through exhibits, publications, civics education, constitutional programs, and scholarships for the citizen leaders of tomorrow, and through lectures like this evening's program. All the programs that we provide are funded through voluntary contributions of Union League members and others who share in the values of the Union League. Many thanks from all of us to you who have contributed so generously to the foundation. Well, since the government shutdown of the League and of the in-person programming of the Legacy Foundation, the volunteers and staff of the Legacy Foundation have done a remarkable job of creating and presenting online programs. Believe it or not, tonight is our 45th virtual program since April, and we have many more that are scheduled over the next few months. I'm also happy to announce that at least one of our upcoming programs will be available in person. It's the next exhibit in the Heritage Center entitled Ballot Box, America's Fight for the Vote. It will trace the history of voting rights in the United States from the adoption of the Constitution to today, and it will open next Friday, September 25th. For more information on the exhibit and the programs of the Legacy Foundation, please visit unionleagueheritagecenter.org. It's actually ulheritagecenter.org. So tonight's program is about COVID and the real health cost of the COVID crisis. To further introduce the program and our guest will be our moderator for the evening, the executive director of the Legacy Foundation and our friend, John Miko. Thank you, Steve. Uh, welcome everyone to our public affairs program. Uh, looking forward to a great uh, program with our guest. Uh, before I introduce our guest and our program, we will have a Q&A uh, section at, towards the end of uh, the chat with Bobby Herzberg. And if you would like to ask a question, you can ask that any time during the program through the Q&A function, which you can find down at the bottom center of your screen if you're, screen, if you're watching on Zoom. So the Q&A function down there, just ask questions as we go along. We'll get to as many of them uh, as we can. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about COVID and healthcare and other costs of our uh, government's um, reaction and policies uh, towards the coronavirus. Um, and to help us through this discussion, we have a wonderful friend of the Legacy Foundation, uh, Bobby Herzberg. Bobby uh, has been involved in many of the programs of the Legacy and Foundation over the years, including uh, she was instrumental in creating the Liberty Series and uh, Liberty Program. Uh, she was a great friend of, of our, uh, our, our great benefactors, the Templetons, Pina and Jack Templeton. And um, uh, it's a wonderful thrill to have uh, the political economist, the uh, healthcare cost expert, uh, a senior fellow at the F.A. Hayek program, uh, in an advanced study of philosophy, politics, and economics at the Mercatus Center, Bobby Herzberg. Bobby, welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is a, a great honor, and I always love being with my friends at the um, uh, Union League and especially uh, the Legacy uh, Foundation. So thank you very much for including me tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. Where, and you're coming to us from... Um, I'm where? out in Utah. Out in Utah. <laughs> yeah, just outside Salt Lake City in Utah. Wonderful. Well, we have a lot to a lot to get to, um, and you and I were chatting earlier. And I want to start. Um, well, let me start with this. Let's remember how we got here a little bit. So, it was March, and in Philadelphia, it was actually March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, uh, when mm -hmm. pretty much everything came to a halt. Uh, our economy was shut down uh, for the most part. Uh, we could not uh, travel. Uh, schools were shuttered. Uh, most health care ended. Uh, the majority of it did, except for COVID in some other cases. Um, and everything kind of came to a screeching halt. People stopped working. Uh, people then were laid off. And this was on an effort to flatten the curve, et cetera. We'll get into a lot of that in a moment. And a, a month, about five weeks later, um, this was all, of course, mandated at the state level, as it should be in, in our uh, federal democracy. Um, but the governors were having these these 
press conferences and Cuomo's was becoming quite famous. He was becoming a celebrity. I want to read to you, Bobby, um, a little excerpt from a press conference that Cuomo had, and it's a little back and forth with a reporter. This is, I'll, I'll try to do it justice. Um, so the reporter is explaining that there's incredible pain um, and harm that's happening because of the shutdown. And she ends with this statement. Their point is the cure can't be worse than the illness itself. And the governor responds, quote, the illness is death. What is worse than death? The reporter says, but what if the economy failing equals death? And the governor responds, but it doesn't. It doesn't equal death. Economic hardship, yes, not death. Emotional hardship, yes, very bad, not death. Domestic violence on the increase, very bad, not death, not death. Bobby, what's wrong with this thinking? Uh, where to begin? <laughs> uh, I, I understand um, certainly back early on in, uh, uh, in this crisis, and with responses to the crisis, and especially within New York uh, State that was hit hardest in terms of the costs and consequences of very clear uh, Governor Cuomo is trying to overstate uh, the way in which one would want to think about some of this. And um, so as a result, He's saying death is the response to everything. We know that's not true. We know that death is the response for some people in this, and we'll look a bit at um, how that breaks down. Uh, but whenever we go to a social policy or any kind of political policy, we have to weigh the different valuation that we have for the costs and benefits associated with it. We all have different risk mixes in the US and around the world. So we're much more likely to do things like extreme sports and skiing and all sorts of things that pose certain risk. Um, and some people don't wanna do that and they're much more cautious, other people want to. And so whenever we're talking about it, we need to talk about those trade-offs that we make between how we might value some of the activity and how we think about uh, the cost that that might bear. And if you pull up that uh, first slide, Joe, if you could pull that up for me and we put that on the screen. Okay, if you look at this slide, what you'll note um, here is the range of risk associated with death. Uh, uh, when Cuomo says, that's not death. That's, you know, bad things, but it's not death. Well, first of all, some of the things he outlines there are death. Uh, certainly, we know there have been deaths from um, spousal abuse and uh, child abuse uh, out there. Likewise, other health conditions and other uh, problems, we know there are increases, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, in terms of recession and the health consequences that are associated with those. So whenever we're dealing with some of these kinds of problems, uh, what we know is we're going to have to weigh how serious we think about this. This is a, a chart from uh, CDC. And what it looks at is the risk or factors that increase um, individual risk. And so of death or hospitalization, those are the two things listed here, the comparison group is the group between 18 and 29. And what you find is for people under the age of four, it's nine times lower than those that are 18 to 29. It's 16 times lower if you're in the five to 17. But up here at 85 plus, it's 630 times as risky when we're talking about COVID. So clearly as we're talking about lockdowns that are going to lock down the entire economy, we're going to be dealing with death as a risk very differentially. We're also going to be dealing with sort of, so the benefits if you're over 85 of a lockdown is pretty hefty, but the benefits of a lockdown if you're 18 or uh, if you're a school child or whatever are far less. 
And there was just none of that in um, Governor Cuomo's uh, presentation of everything is death associated with this illness. And so well, early me... on, maybe that's what we thought. We certainly don't think that today um, in the way in which we're managing this. And, and yet many of our policies are, are very similar uh, to what they were back in March and April. I have a couple of, I was on the CDC website um, and, and just, I, I'm going to throw a couple of stats at you, uh, Bobby. Um, 65 plus, uh, and this is nationally, uh, the number of COVID cases this past was five per 100,000 people, and that's the highest level. Uh, when you go lower than that, it's de minimis. It's almost zero. It's less than one for everybody. When you get real low, it's, it's literally in the so tiny, it really is almost a non-factor by a, st a statistical uh, analysis. Not only that, but um, less than 1% this last week, and this has been true since May, less than 1% of hospital emergency uh, visits are for flu-like symptoms. And I, th I believe that now less than half of those are even COVID. So we're not even seeing anyone get sick of COVID now, yet we continue on these same kind of paths. Let's talk about more of the costs from a healthcare perspective of the, the shutdown. And let me throw a couple of uh, just uh, uh, questions to you. Um, to talk to us about what we didn't do with healthcare in April, May, and then now we're trying to catch up in terms of preventative medicine and all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, uh, and that's a, that's a really critical issue uh, that we have to take into account is we do care about health. So at the beginning, you often heard uh, people saying, how dare you think about wealth over health? And that was posed as what people, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge-like people sitting around not caring that the people are dying around them. But what is very clear is that there are relationships between health and uh, wealth and health and uh, 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 economic wealth uh, to um, uh, with regard to our, um, our health care. And so, for example, in the last, um, in the last uh, period, and, and Joe, you might bring up that next slide, and these are the only two slides, so we won't get too far off the mix, but if you could bring up that other one. Here, this is uh, from a, a, a report uh, from World Economic Forum, a report by Chedlak and Bainham uh, that appeared in June 26th of 2020. And what this speaks to is people showing up at emergency rooms with various conditions. And so none of these note are COVID related uh, here. But what we see is in February, how many people were showing up um, with those types of conditions and what happens by the time uh, you get to March, uh, we get serious reductions in the number of people showing up at those emergency rooms with these very serious other types of health conditions and emergencies. And one of the worries that emergency room physicians had was that people are feeling these but they're so fearful of COVID transmission and going to a hospital that perhaps they were not uh, going in when they really needed to be going into a hospital. And so that's just one indication of a set of conditions that might get worse as a result of this core focus on COVID to the exception of all other health considerations. Another uh, indicator is in the early months there, and especially in hard hit areas like New York and Pennsylvania, for example, we saw doctors uh, visit and preventive testing for serious conditions, uh, cancers and um, things such as uh, diabetes, which it, we know is related uh, to COVID risk. Those testing and uh, services were declined by as much as 90% in very hard hit areas. 
uh, for some tests and by two thirds in a number of tests across the country. And for all that preventive service that is delayed, we know that it's hard to catch up with those preventive services once things do open up. And so one of the worries is you're going to have various acute types of conditions uh, discovered later and this with greater uh, negative consequences and higher death rates uh, from those. So at the very least, we have these kinds of, and then additionally, economic conditions clearly create greater um, health problems and potential death from things like suicide and suicide attempts and mental health and depression and other areas such as that. And we have very good sort of studies coming out of the Great Recession and how much that ticked up during uh, those, those years where we were facing very serious economic conditions. So we know these are important trade-offs. So uh, statistically, Bobby, people that have jobs are healthier than those that are unemployed. Is that correct? Uh, usually, it's I a mean, statistical there are question. For example, yes, yes, it is true. And one of the reasons, and it varies, you know, by society, how we address some of these. For example, um, in the United States, where employment is often associated with our health care. Losing employment because of an economic condition may mean you're now out of health uh, and you may not go and get the treatment that you need because it has to come out of pocket. And so we know that there are um, consequences, um, certainly uh, the stress and other things that are related uh, being out of work enhance uh, the likelihood that we're going to find ourselves um, either with a variety of conditions um, and it can exacerbate the conditions that we already have. Uh, for example, people with cancer and people with uh, chronic conditions may have worse consequences when they are also concerned about economics. So let, let me ask about kind of decision and policy making and, and how we got here and how this, these decisions are made. It's, it's very frustrating. We had one of your colleagues uh, on back in, I believe it was May or the end of April, uh, Russ Roberts. And we talked about all the mistakes that were made and they were clearly mistakes made. This, we're talking about the same mistakes, but most of them were corrected. Um, so where did we get lost where we have all these experts, and, and Russ and I talked about the demise of experts, that clearly after this, you can't just listen to an expert or a couple of experts in one area. You've got to take experts in a lot of areas. Yet we don't seem to be doing that even today, maybe a bit more, but what, how did this happen? What, what, is, what is going on, Bobby, where we're not making decisions based on lots of different factors, but rather stop corona at all cost? How do we get here? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. I think when someone comes in with charts and models and estimates that predict things like millions dying in the United States from COVID, it is very difficult for a politician to ignore that. And as you know, we frequently do not go back and uh, hold people accountable for the mistakes they made in the past. So a politician who says, I care about your life, death is all that matters, Cuomo's statement there makes him a hero because he cares about these deaths, whereas other people are talking about the economy and things. So I think it's, it's the political costs and benefits tend to be different than the economic and health and other costs and benefits. Now, if it goes on long enough, I think that switches. And one of the things that we need to worry about is people often form their impressions about science and experts and other things in those critical years of 18 to 29, those years that they're not seeing the results in terms of people around them. 
um, if in fact they lose confidence in those kinds of estimates, it's much harder for them to behave in the way that you want them to and to respond the right way in the next time. So crying wolf can be very costly in terms of getting people to go along. But, but I guess my question is maybe a little nu more nuanced and maybe that's what we're missing in all this. So you have the epidemic, you know, you have the, the epidemic uh, doctors saying this is uh, going to be a disaster. Millions of people are going to die. Where's the cancer guy saying, don't, please don't shut down all the cancer treatments. Where are the, you know, where is that happening? I mean, policymakers make decisions based on similar kinds of factors all the time. We raised the speed limit from 55 to 70, knowing that more people would die. And I know they talked about that. They said, this is how many more people will die next year if we raise the speed limit. This is how many more people will die over the next, yet we raised the speed limit because we made a decision that it was worth it. How come we can't do that now? Well, I think we do still do that. And clearly we're making those decisions relative to these other health consequences, relative to the economy and relative to other things we do care about. Um, so it's not as if we're not making those decisions and we're not evaluating them in that way. It's that those politicians, and you see it play out in the politics of this election right now, um, not being serious enough about a pandemic is costly to your political health. And so politicians look around. Cuomo has a book coming out, I understand, and he is often recognized, spoke at the Democratic uh, Convention. He's seen as a hero. And yet we know that he made some serious mistakes in how he played out with the policy. For example, when they demanded that COVID, positive COVID patients be moved to into nursing homes with no ability for the nursing home to test for positivity at the time that they did that admission by state mandate, what they did was put other people in those nursing homes at some risk. How much, we really don't know because the studies have not been able to be done yet on that in part because of the politics of it. And so one of the real challenges I think that we face in these kinds of circumstances is holding people accountable. Scientists will often say, we don't know. And in pandemics, the biggest reference in this was back to the 1918 pandemic and people were looking at millions of people killed. And when President Trump, for example, used the example of flu, you still see that being you know, made fun of. And yet that was pandemics of the past and we still continue. And in fact, it, I think it was 2017, we had a particularly bad um, flu season where we lost in excess of 80,000 uh, flu deaths that year. We didn't hear people shutting down economies and saying things like that. So clearly, um, for some reason, when this hit, it caught the public attention and allowed them to go full steam ahead with models that didn't really um, hold up as the data has uh, played out to the same extent. So Bobby, you've done some work on, on, um, on an international or you've looked at this in an international uh, scale as well. And it, it is interesting that our reaction wasn't all that different than anyone else's reaction. Yeah. Um, the politics are different in um, Great Britain than they are in Italy, than they are in New Zealand, they are in, but we both all had pretty much the same reaction, not entirely, but for the most part, most Western countries and a lot of the Asian countries did the same thing. Um, what has happened to those that didn't do the same thing? And we all talk about Sweden, but what did happen to Sweden and what do things look like there and, and are they different? Did it work? Um, well, a lot of people, and that will be one of, I think, the greatest tests of all is to look at the longer term consequences of Swedish uh, decision making on this, because Sweden did not shut down. 
uh, they were, you know, they practiced safer behaviors. They're Swedish, so they're very socially minded. And as a result, they practiced a lot of the, um, you know, social distancing and limiting sort of the riskiest of behaviors. But they did not shut their economy down. They did not shut their schools down. They did not shut their restaurants and bars down. They continued to do these things in the safest way they knew how. They did see higher deaths than their neighboring European uh, countries, uh, but they did not see higher deaths than, say, New York um, saw. Part of that is we know now. Uh, there are genetic differences in terms of groups and health differences, underlying health costs uh, that might help uh, explain that. But what they decided was, we are going to have to perhaps live with this for some time. We're going to choose to live with this with an open society and economy. They did not have the economic consequences, although they pay some. We're all shut down, so people aren't buying goods from them as much as they would have been in the absence of it. And now I think more people are saying, you know what, that probably makes some sense. I can use an example from the US and that is Utah. Utah did lock down certain counties and certain areas. It did not lock down entirely. It made it much more of a local decision. And as a result, first of all, we've had very low rates of death and hospitalization. We had a blip, especially when we opened up more uh, in May, when we started opening up, we had a little bit of a surge, but a, a surge in cases, but not necessarily in deaths and hospitalizations. And now if you go out on this, you there's traffic jams, there's all kinds of, it looks pretty normal out here in Utah, and yet we're still seeing declining rates of cases and of hospitalizations and deaths through that entire period. So we, we now are we're in the first couple of weeks of school, college and universities. Um, some have gone back. Um, I don't know what things are like out in Utah. Most of our schools here, I think the majority of them are online. Some are, are in person. Um, we, we have uh, lots of new cases on college campuses. I saw a statistic the other day after the first week, there were 26,000 new cases among college students. Um, and this was an alarming uh, statistic and it was shown in this uh, very alarming way. Uh, but if you read through the, uh, the, not one of them was hospitalized. So is this a pan, you know, is this a, an illness if no one gets sick? Um, and that's a whole group of people that um, are being, are not going to school or they're going in a different way. Um, you know, what, what happened to essential workers? If education is not essential, um, I, I'm kind of lost here. What, what, react to that. Yeah. I honestly, I think it's one of the really, the biggest, one of the biggest costs we will pay with this is the educational uh, loss from um, this period where we now know from just the statistics, they know if you sign in on um, these remote classes and so on. Um, and in some large school districts, they've had 20, 25% not sign on at all during these online type of education. So what that suggests is there's going to be a lot of uneducated individuals in our society much less than before. And they tend to be among the group of people least able to deal with that. The uh, lower income um, and those that may be more disadvantaged are also those that are probably going to pay the highest price with regard to those types of costs in addition to the economic um, job costs and so on that they're also facing at higher rates. And so as we start to weigh these differences and think about it, then we say, okay, if all of these people are getting these cases, but they're not dying, they're not being hospitalized, then maybe this is a risk we can live with at some level. Now there is a another social component to it, and that is that young people may be carriers, even if they're asymptomatic,
symptomatic, they may still carry it and transmit it to those people that have that much higher risk, those 85 year olds, et cetera, uh, 75, et cetera, in the other um, stats. If that's the case, then what we really need is for people to say, if in fact you're around people that are very uh, senior or at risk or immune uh, compromised in some way, you need to be much more careful with respect to them. But everyone else should be able to open up, do this, go about your normal life and gain the benefits that come from that social experience and that educational experience. And that's what we've seen. Where it's opened up, there's people that get quarantined because they're, they're infectious, but often they're sitting in their dorm room still doing classes because they aren't feeling especially bad um, symptoms uh, or relatively mild uh, symptoms. So what, what do things look like in Utah with regard to education? I'm just curious, what's happening there at the local? Most, most of the schools have opened up and are offering classes in person. Um, they're practicing as safe uh, practices as they can. Now, Salt Lake City and some of the, some of the districts in the most uh, metropolitan area where it has been harder to open up. Uh, we had the very first high school football game in the country was held between two uh, high schools in uh, Utah um, because that's sort of what Utah does. They get on with it. It's not to say that people aren't being community minded and caring about others. I don't think you see that. I think people trying uh, to um, take take precautions, but they also understand the benefits that come from having kids in school, especially what we see in the economy for women and for minorities, they are the ones that are getting hit the most with the economic consequences of children not being in school and thus them not being able to go back and do employment in the way uh, that would be successful for their family. And so we're going to see a lot of the gains we've had in the past few years with regard to equalization of opportunity may be degraded by this uh, response to COVID that tends to have its greatest costs on both women and uh, lower income and minorities um, in the economic consequence. So a lot of that is going to take years to figure out the, the effect of that. But let's let's switch or let's pivot, as, as everyone is saying now, to a, another topic. Um, and I didn't throw this, I didn't mention this to you before, but let's talk about government spending and COVID. Um, so we've got trillions of dollars now coming from the federal government into um, COVID. We have much less tax revenue coming, especially at the state uh, level. Um, put your economist hat on, tell me the costs here with this. I don't think I can even, even begin to estimate um, all of the costs. Now, part of it is how quickly we come back. So anytime you have a recession, and that's one of the debates that is going on right now, is, is this a V? Is this a super V? Is this a W? Is this a U? Is this, what are we doing? So part of the economy will come back, but until we resolve some of uh, the issues like we talked about of kids in school or childcare considerations, it's not going to come back fully. And there are certainly sectors of the economy that are going to have trouble going forward. So we know travel, hotels, anything that's communal, transit, uh, all of those kinds of areas are going to be, may never come back to the same extent. Additionally, the small businesses that are out there that are now, they've run out of any sort of assistance or subsidies that were intended to get us through that short period of time where we would have to pay this high price as that has been extended 
then that money starts to run out. And unless you want to run additional deficits, the Fed, you know, printing money and keeping uh, interest rates low um, and, and lending money in a way, all of those fiscal and uh, financial consequences uh, will burden the future. So in this particular uh, disease, illness, uh, this pandemic, it is double whammy on the youngest of, in terms of the costs that are going to be paid. They are the ones who will face future fiscal difficulties due to the money we're running up now uh, from government spending. They are the ones who are paying the price in terms of educational deficiencies uh, that might occur. And they are not the ones that are at the greatest risk and thus seeing the greatest benefit from these policies. And so there's a real redistribution going on here. It's a continuation of some of the things we've heard from you know, Social Security, Medicare, and other uh, spending programs in the, in the US government. Um, and it's interesting to see how that will play out over time. There, there I used, honestly don't know. There, there <laughs> was they're a, going to get mad about this at some point and uh, uh, not take it anymore. I just don't know. The, the, the happiness index, right? You're familiar <laughs> with the happiness index? Yes. Um, yes. You know, it's this index that's used and, and tracks, quote, happiness uh, around the world by country. And, you know, all those Nordic countries always wind up on top. We're somewhere, you know, somewhere up uh, near the top, but never there. You just um, want to be Danish, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm curious, you know, we, we have our politicians talking about not one death and, and talking about in terms of that, but yet the happiness index is this kind of cool idea. Anyhow, I don't know how accurate it is, but it's a cool idea that we can measure happiness. And part of that is about freedom. In fact, quite a bit of it they use on those charts is about what you're allowed to do, say, uh, think, um, and all those things, travel, all that. There's also wealth uh, built into that uh, index. Um, you know, our happiness index has gone like, you know, through to the toilet right now, right? But, but no one seems to care about that. It, it's about, you know, we don't equate this anymore as some sort of can we can we talk at a national level about happiness index and, and you know get back to some happiness around here? Yeah, I think I think it's a challenge. It's a challenge because other so many different things make us happy. One of the things about Austrian economics, which we do at George Mason and uh, the work of Hayek, my dear Hayek here. There, there we go. Um, uh, F. A. Hayek is he talks about. Uh, and the other Austrians, subjective preferences. So, and that's one of the things I've tried to stress here is we don't value the same things. And death is not obviously, or risk of death is not the only thing people care about. And especially even young people, um, they wouldn't drive too fast. They wouldn't binge drink. They wouldn't, uh, they, they commit suicide. Uh, I mean, all of these are indicators of not having death as the only thing that uh, is on your, uh, on your mind with regard to it. Some of the other joy and value they get out of skiing too fast down a hill or um, jumping off of a cliff or filming yourself doing crazy things um, and posting it on the internet are all a piece of that sort of very different calculus than I would make, for example. What makes me joyful are things like family and other uh, considerations, travel, seeing friends. All of those things have been taken away from me of late. They've been, you can't go around people to the same extent. You can't hug people. I'm a hugger. And so uh, having to give up hugging diminishes my uh, happiness index uh, by not being able uh, to enjoy it. It's great that we have technology that allows us to do a certain amount of that like this, but it's not the same. 
and we know it's not the same. When we see each other in person, it feels different. And that is part of what makes every single day of life worth living. And if we had to give all of that up just to make sure we never faced any risk of death, we would all lock ourselves in our homes all the time, but we don't and we shouldn't. And so one of the things that politicians don't always capture very well is the fact that it's very different things uh, that we care about and how we intersubjectively um, address those is tough. And so we do it politically. That's what politics is about. If we all had exactly the same values, if science could tell us absolutely that this was true and that this was the only thing, then it would be a lot easier, but it's so not. So put, it, put on your, your uh, look into your crystal ball, Bobby, and, and what, where, where do you think we're going to be um, with this, with, with COVID, with government uh, shutdown of, of, uh, of our economy? Um, and let me give you the, I'll tell you the scenario, you tell me what you think is gonna okay. happen. So we continue to see cases, um, maybe they even continue to be at the same pace. We continue to see um, smaller um, uh, number of hospitalizations, smaller amount of deaths um, for a variety of reasons. Um, by the way, I, I, wanna, I have to point this out because I, I did a lot in the last hour, I was looking at all the different charts. All of them, we go to all the newspapers, the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, they start with the same chart and it's COVID cases. And the chart only goes up, yeah. right? Because yeah. one case means it goes up one, right? They don't, you have, to, you have to go to the third page to find any other kind of chart. So I would ask all of our viewers to, to never look at that chart. It doesn't tell you anything about, about the trend. There's no trend there. One makes it one higher. Um, every one of them is the same. So let's let's uh, say that all these things remain about the same. Let's say that hospitalizations go lower, death rates go lower, but we still have lots of cases. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think we first of all, one of the amazing things that's happened as a result of all this is some of the innovation that's going on out there and recognition of how much we get in our own way with the policies that we make. So for example, at Mercatus, they've done a lot of work on regulation and its impact on healthcare and those types of questions. And one of the things that happened was when we thought, started thinking about how in the world are we going to solve this? We need a vaccine. Uh, we need to have people be able to get telehealth treatment and so on and so forth. Um, why can't we do that? Well, they found out, well, because we regulate and we prevent it. We prevent this kind of provider from offering that kind of service. We don't pay for telehealth. So people won't deliver telehealth if uh, it's not paid for under their insurance. And, and um, drug testing and all of the efficacy rules and so on uh, make it so onerous that it usually takes around four years to get a vaccine out. Well, when the consequences were so great, all of a sudden, so those are the good things. We've realized it. Now, the question is, will we actually change? Maybe not. Maybe we'll go right back to the old things and not attribute it to this. Uh, but I think that the vaccine and the innovations and our ways of interacting, um, our ways of working remotely, all of the technology that has emerged out of this will change us going forward and we will see a slow, uh, somewhat different economy going forward, and people may have to adapt for jobs in that regard, we will also see this resolved at some level. It may never be fully resolved. It may be like flu is, where every year we have vaccines and things, but we don't get rid of all of it and we don't get rid of all of the deaths, but we get rid of some of the worst kinds of outcomes um, that are more generally um, happening in society. And I think that's our going ahead. Um, and I don't think it's too far in our future, remarkably, because no one would have bet on that, I think, when this all began, that we would innovate our way out of it and yet 
it's, I think, testimony to the market and human creativity and science that we are finding um, solutions out there. And I am very confident that that will occur. So I, we have a question and it's, um, I, I think it's an interesting one. Um, are there lessons to be learned from COVID for climate change? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Policy prescriptions for both seem to be based largely on alarming but highly uncertain models with insufficient consideration of policy trade-offs. You care to comment? Um, I think that that's often the case. When we have really big problems um, that a life, certainly like a climate change would be, um, we have modelers that have to make assumptions. The challenge is that the world doesn't stay constant and this is a simplification, it is not reality. And so as it plays out, the model is always wrong. How wrong it is, is always the question and hopefully science improves the model going forward as I think we've seen with COVID. The initial ones are Cuomo's kind of statement about death, it all equals death. Now we know so much more so one of the reasons that Utah had a case uh, fatality 0.7%, whereas New York had a case fatality rate of 9.8%, New York City. The difference between those two is learning. We learned a lot. With global warming, the difficulty is it's very hard to go back and run the alternate model. And that's similar to this. It's very hard to go back. New states can find, we know more because of New York and Pennsylvania and early states, we can use that information and it's, it's very much in the same policy debate. For global warming, because of the long time frames and no control over the globe. I mean, no, there is no single government uh, or you know, great entity that can impose these kinds of policies. So you find yourself very quickly in this um, dilemma where even if you put yourself on a very strict global climate diet, if the rest of the world doesn't do it, you can't avoid their climate. Um, and so it's, it's one of those where I think it's an even more difficult um, problem uh, to try and address. And in order to get people to care about it because of that long time lag, I think you're more likely to see people perhaps exaggerate the consequences, not unlike the very beginning of COVID, where stay home and right. if death is why I stay home. If you tell me a bad respiratory issue for a few days, that's not enough to make me give up everything else. Um, so one, one last question. Um, and it's about the cost and impact on the rise of, and you've touched a little bit on this, drug use, alcohol, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, do we, do we really have a handle on that, especially, and, and I'm, my, my wife is a, a teacher and, and she has talked about this. They don't, you know, if you don't see your kids, you don't know what's going on in their, in their, uh, their home life. And often the first people to see any kind of serious domestic issue are teachers. They don't have teachers looking at them. So do we have any idea of what the real cost of that kind of, um, uh, of those kinds of things are? I know it will be costly. We know that those that are most vulnerable are also those that are um, uh, likely not even signing in to Zoom classrooms, et cetera. And so we know that we're going to see an uptick. How large it is sort of depends on a lot of other factors. One of the things that I think has kept it from being as bad as it might have been is the government dumping huge, huge amounts of money into the economy um, in a way that is very hard to sustain. But that did take the worst of the 
economic consequences and some of the things that might exacerbate domestic violence and other uh, consequences such as that and make them less um, damaging. Over time, as those things fade away, we go back to more normal unemployment and some of the stresses of that, I think you're going to see a huge uptick, uh, especially with uncertainty and especially in certain fields where the field isn't coming back as it was before because of people's worries about these more general disease and other um, infection kinds of considerations. Bobby, uh, we're out of time. Um, you know, you and I could talk all night. Maybe we'll do that soon. I hope to do it in person. I hope you're back here uh, at the Union League soon. Um, I don't know when that will be when you get back east, but uh, I hope it is soon. And um, I, I thank you for uh, for this, but also for everything you've done uh, for the Legacy Foundation and the Union League. Keep up the great work. And um, again, let's uh, let's see each other in person very very soon. I. I hope that is the case. Uh, even though I am towards that, uh, I am in those higher risk groups, I am ready to get back. I am ready to get back to work. I have balanced it in my, in my uh, own subjective values and the value of a nice day at the Union League is uh, I think well worth uh, the risk that that might pose in terms of uh, my health. So I look forward to it. Again, thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Thank you. So our next program uh, will be next Wednesday, a Civil War Roundtable with David Welker on uh, Antietam and the cornfield. Um, so that's next Wednesday, the 23rd. And then we're going to take a slight break from these uh, types of programs because we have our Good Citizen Day on October 6th. Uh, which is not open to the general public. It's a program where we bring 300 high school students uh, to learn about the Constitution uh, and about uh, civics in action. Um, we're going to do that virtually. Uh, that's October 6th. But the next one uh, lecture will be on October 13th. It's a Liberty Series with uh, Lenny McAllister from the Commonwealth Foundation and Alan Gelzo, League member, professor at Princeton University. We're going to be talking about the 1619 Project. And we're going to compare that to the 1776 project. You will want to be there. It will be a great discussion. Uh, so until next Wednesday, um, we will uh, see you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you and good night.